Now, Advent comes from a Latin word that means coming or arrival. So during Advent, number one, we look forward to the celebration of the coming of Jesus 2,000 years ago. And number two, we look forward to his return. So Advent is twofold. Up here on the altar, we had um, can a candle. There, that candle. <laughs> we have a candle. The people of God said, Amen. Well, it's been an interesting Sunday morning. I don't know if, how you feel about worship being a little different. Things are in a little bit of a different order. If it's stressful for you, it's more stressful for me. Oh, it's not even stressful. One of the interesting things when I went to Israel is you go to the Temple Mound, the uh, steps are all different sizes. Uh, each are a different size as you go toward it. Uh, and uh, our guide, our tour guide, told us the reason they did that, it's not that people back in the day couldn't make even steps. They wanted you to pay attention on your way to worship. Uh, because apparently, we occasionally are thinking about other things while we're doing other things. Y'all, you don't know what I'm talking about, do you? Yeah, we're, we're not always focused on what we should be focused on. So as we enter the Christmas season, I look at the front of the bulletin and I think about Mary and Joseph walking and I'm thinking about in my own life how this season gets so busy and I don't slow down and move into it. I really feel for my wife, Deb. She cooks a full meal. She gets everything on the table and I'm already relaxed. Uh, and then you come in and you know what I'm saying? God bless you, ladies and men who do the cooking. Uh, you make us be able to relax in the moment. Well, as we move into our text this morning, our Corinthians text is interesting. It is written to a group of people that are extremely cosmopolitan. Uh, they are a trading port. And if it were available in the ancient world, they had it in that city. So anything you could want, any way you wanted it, they had it your way. And so you could go there and the church was planted. One of the early churches is planted there. And there's a piece of advice given to the church. We're going to look at that this morning. The book of Mark is, as we are in the middle of Advent, we're at the very beginning of Advent, the second coming of Christ. Uh, in Advent, we contemplate the first coming as well as the second coming. So let's look at those two readings this morning. I'll pick up first with 1 Corinthians, the, fourth, uh, the first chapter for the fourth verse. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and in knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by him. You were called into the fellowship by his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now to the book of Mark. The 13th chapter. The 24th verse. But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the son of man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out his angels and gather the elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and pour forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that it's near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about the day or the hour, no one knows, neither angels in heaven nor the sun, 
but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, and when he leaves home, he puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or the midnight, or at the cockcrow, or at the dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, may the meditations of my mind, the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. The Corinthians text says something interesting. You have everything you need. You have everything you need. Does anybody here feel like they already have everything they need this morning? Uh, Yeah, uh, I think in some ways we have everything we need. In other ways, uh, we are lacking in, I don't know, spiritual gifts, what, what the Bible is telling us we have. I, I want to help you out a little bit with this text because there's a little bit of disconnect for me when I think about I have all the gifts that, that are described here. I, I want to help you out in this way because uh, it's written in proper English and we speak Southern English. And there is a disconnect between the two. Uh, for those of you who know, there is something called third person plural, right? And third person plural in correct English is you. And in the South, it's Y'all, thank you very much. Y'all know exactly where I'm going with this. In, in, in this particular pa- passage, uh, the, the advice is this. Y'all have all the gifts y'all need as a group. Are y'all following me? I, we need a Texas translation. I started one in seminary, and uh, I was told not to go on with it. <laughs> Pastor, please stop. I'm going, it, it'll work so great, I'm telling you. It's a gift we all need. Y'all have all the gifts y'all need. Is, is the church, we have everything we need to solve the problems that we have. That's an astounding idea, isn't it? We have everything we need. Well, it reminds me back in the day, I was a Boy Scout, and I was invited after I had reached quite a bit of rank there to go to a weekend, excuse me, it was a whole week of training. Troop Leadership Development Training Camp, it was a full week at El Rancho Sima, and at that week, they only invited those who had had at least several summer camps, uh, several weeks of camping. You had to be at least a star, life, or eagle to be able to go. So they put groups of young men who were that level of training all together, and then they put us through our paces for the week. Now, it's interesting when you have young men who've camped that much, we already know how to put a tent up. We already know how to build a fire. We already know how to do all of that stuff. Uh, That's what a first-class scout can do. He is a first-class camper. Uh, Well, so anyway, we we were up to all those sorts of challenges. And it was told to us later that every challenge they gave us, we had everything we needed to do them. It was a guided experience of being able to have everything we needed, and we were placed in it not to fail, but to succeed. Now, when we think about that, it was, it was interesting. One of the challenges they gave us was, uh, and you've, you people look old enough to remember these, coffee cans. Uh, you, y'all know what a coffee can is? Coffee came in it, and it was a can. Now they're plastic, aren't they, right? Same idea, same size. I think they cut us a few ounces, didn't they? It went from a pound to 14. Anybody else upset about that? I'm sorry, I digress. They gave us a coffee can, and next to it was a soda can, and then a rope encircled the area about 15 feet away, and we were not allowed to go inside the circle, but we had to pick up the can and put it inside the coffee can. And they gave us a cigar box. This really is aging me, right? A cigar box. And in the cigar box was a sundry things. And they told us, everything you need is in that box. There was some string, some rubber bands, clothes pins, uh, paper clips, you know, a pocket knife, you name it, it was in there. And, and as we looked through it all, they said, you can accomplish this task with what you've been given. Well, one of the young men immediately goes, I know how to do this. So he took out the string, folded it once in half, folded it against in half, 
cut it. He had four equal lengths. He took the rubber band. He tied four ends to it. And then we each grabbed a corner of the rope or the string and we pulled. The rubber band opened. We dropped it over the can, let it drop onto the aluminum can, picked it up and dropped it into the coffee can. Now, I, I, I tell you this whole story to tell you this. It was really important to have one of us who knew how to do it. Because some of the junk they put in there was a distraction. And some of, you know, if they only gave us exactly what you needed, you could, it would probably be helpful. But it was the other stuff that's distracting, right? Uh, not that there's anything distracting in life, is there? Uh, there? There was lots of distracting stuff. Now, it's helpful to have one guy there who knows how to do it, but could he do it by himself? No. He needed at least three other guys. So this was one of the challenges, and we had challenge after challenge after challenge. And we learned about leadership by leading. And one of the things that was interesting is as we, we looked at our daily schedule, I had been to camp there so many times I knew how long it took to walk from river camp to horse camp to, to the ridge to uh, all the different camps. And I looked down at where we were supposed to go one day, and we had four hours, and we had five hours of walking. Uh, I, I immediately figured out that one of the challenges was, uh, as the leader that day, uh, we had... Is it going by? You're welcome to pray for somebody as well. Um, as I looked at the calendar, looked at the schedule, I realized we didn't have enough time to do it all. Uh, we had uh, some of the other leaders coming for dinner, so I said, you two guys know how to cook. You go back and cook. You three guys go to horse camp. Us four will go do the other. We divided up, and we went, and we conquered, and we got the whole schedule done. Uh, later, the leaders admitted to me that they weren't sure if I was cheating or not uh, because they had designed it to where you couldn't get everything done so that they could judge who was a better leader. They, they had actually kind of stilted it that way, and uh, uh, apparently I had colored outside the lines, if you can picture me doing these things. You guys have a really good picture of this, don't you? <laughs> uh, I bring all this up because it makes me think about this particular passage. What if life, what if life in the church was designed by God so we had all we needed to do all the things we needed to do? What, what if God set us up for success instead of failure? I think those are, are very relevant questions, and, and I think that's so. I think as the church, as the people of God, we've been given gifts and abilities, but if we're going to do the things that God has called us to do, we're going to actually have to interact. We're going to have to get along. We're going to have to lead. We're going to have to uh, look at each other's ideas. I believe that God gives each one of us a piece of the puzzle, but we can't see the picture unless we bring our pieces and we lay them down and we look. I think God has designed it that way so that we have to interact and live with each other and learn. We've been set up to succeed through God. Well, as I think about that, I look at this other idea. We're standing at the very beginning of Advent. And Advent is a season of hope, but if you're going to move into uh, a candle of hope and a light of hope, first you start in darkness. One of the things that I learned at Asbury that they spoke very eloquently about is they said you need to pause and spend time in the moment and read the scripture where it is. And so my first sermon that I came out of school was Christmas Eve morning. We had a Christmas Eve fell on a Sunday morning. Uh, it was my first appointment. They allowed me to preach to 900 of my newest friends. Uh, my goal that morning was to not throw up and to not fall off the pulpit. They had a really tall one, so those, and I did not do either of those. Uh, but my sermon was to perceive the darkness before the light comes into the world. How dark the world is, how dark the world was before the light came. As such, it's that way today as well before the second coming. The reason we cry out for God, the reason we look for God to come again is because we look around and we go, the world is a broken place. There are hurting people. The ground is shifting and we're not altogether pleased with it. And it's a good thing to realize that. And it's a good thing to realize that because the difference between that camp in real life is that at camp, they gave us the assignments in life, we don't always get what the assignments are. We, we don't always perceive what we need to be about and what we need to be doing. And the passage is very interesting here. It says, and you know what? Learn the lesson from the fig tree. You look at the fig tree. 
You know when it's going to bloom. You know the signs of it. Well, wake up and look around the world. Wake up and see what's going on. Now, I don't know if any of you have watched the news lately, if you've looked around in the world, but I, you know, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but there is bad news in the land. There, there are riots, and there are people starving to death, and there is war, and there is famine, and there is brokenness, and the Scripture says you have everything you need. Well, where are we? We need to step into that place. We need to be the church. We need to learn to love and live with each other so that we can take our assignments and move into that world. That is the assignment. So I say stand and look at the darkness and then we can perceive what the day's assignment is and then we need to move in it. Now, can this church fix the problem with ISIS? Going with probably not. But there are some problems here in Crockett that I think we can stand in the gap in, the things that we need to move into, the, the world around us where we can heal and live and love with each other. I think we are called into those things. But, and, and I'm going to try to land on this story and so you guys pay attention for one more minute. One of the problems we have as the church is occasionally we don't all get along. I know that's stunning and one of the problems is, is, uh, is we are occasionally judgmental as humans. I know y'all aren't, but I am, so I'll just go on about me. And if you fit into this, you just pick it up. But we're judgmental because we look around and we go, well, why isn't him doing what I'm doing? Why isn't he doing the same things I'm doing? In fact, we look around and we go, well, I know what my job is, but the other people ought to be doing the same job I am. And I'll, I'll give you a, a good example of it. Back in my days at Kingwood, and we led men's ministry, one of the things that came out of that, as we led it, was that we had men that were along the continuum of discipleship. We had some that were outside the church. We had some that had just come into the church. We had some that could translate Revelation in the Greek. Uh, we had people all along the discipleship continuum. Now, I will tell you this. We had some leaders, and I'll give you one of their names. Purvis, lovely, wonderful, great man. He was great at leading leaders very spiritual man, but you did not want him near new Christians. Uh, and, and, uh, and it was because he scared the fool out of them. Uh, he used church language. He knew how to help our leaders grow. And so what we came to the conclusion of is to his ministry was to a particular people, to a particular time in their life, to grow them in a certain way. And that was the place to put him. And for John, he was great at reaching those who were far from God. And in fact, I witnessed him with the lost, sitting and praying with people who I know hadn't prayed in a long time. He was able to reach them. Each of us have our place in the kingdom. The problem was when we all got together as a group, one thought we should have a men's ministry that was deep, and we had another group that said we need to have a men's ministry that is wide. And my answer was yes. Uh, as, as I answered to the group back in the day, I, I need a group to go and fix breakfast. I need a group to go to horse camp, and we need a group to go. You see, in the church, we've equipped, and we have all that we need. Unfortunately, we spend a little too much time arguing with each other as to what the other ought to be doing that looks like what we're doing. You don't have to say amen yet. My, my witness to you this morning is... We each have a job. We each need to be awake. We need to be looking and seeing where God will put us. And we are longing for God to come again. We, we are longing for Him to come and work in our world. For the only work that we can do, the only work that lasts, is the work that we do with Christ. The work that we do in this world of healing through Him. So as we step into communion this morning, we take communion with this understanding that it is Christ in us working in the world to complete the job He gave us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.